it is a major struggle for us as technicians to just see these boards as having the same function because they really do and that's one of the goals that i have here is i want to help give you a, a deep enough understanding to know that you're doing the same thing with these and we don't need to think of it as though we're not. Just so you know, this is another part of a continuation of a series over DDC systems and controls. So there is a full tech guide at hvactime.shop that you can get. It's a full PDF. You can also get a hard copy version. That paper will get shipped to you upon your order. The purpose of these guides is to be a, a tool for you to use to help you, this video is a companion to the physical guide. The guide has a lot of this information along with pictures and examples, something you can carry with you or have a digital version on your phone. With that, let's get into what a PLC is first. So PLC stands for Programmable Logic Controller. You would think of this like you would see a building automation system or building management, a BMS. What's great about PLCs is they can be used for a wide variety of things, more than just HVAC. You could also tie in your security, your fire system, your lighting system. There's a lot that these are capable of performing based off of the specifications. And because this system is so modular, it really helps make it a viable option for a building-wide system. Now there's one major thing that separates the PLC from an OEM board, and that comes down to it's field programmable. It is fully customizable up to the skill level of the technician programming it in the system he's using. Let's discuss a little more about an OEM board. In the examples we're talking about here, I'm gonna really focus in on the HVAC side of this, and this is really just an HVAC equipment board. This particular one is out of a VRF system. Now this is a very purpose-built board. It is specifically designed for what it's being used for and why it's being used. But that doesn't mean that it's not gonna be used in multiple types of systems. An example of this is this EEPROM. So these boards come with these little EEPROM chips and this makes them more versatile. They can produce the same base board but use it in several systems and applications. And the EEPROM is doing just a very simple programming in terms of letting the system know that, hey, you are this tonnage with this configuration of compressors and pipes and such. It is assisting the microprocessor in knowing how it needs to respond to the system it's installed in. One thing that's great about the EEPROM style of things is if you have a system, say you've got two VRFs on a roof that, are, uh, that have a bad board in one of them, and maybe there are different tonnages and sizes altogether, but when you look at their base board, the base board is the same exact part number between the two. What will be different is the EEPROM chips inside of them. And I've done this many times. You can just take that base board, go to the system that is more critical, and install it in there and swap the EEPROMs and get that system back online. Now many times that may mean recommissioning the system, but at least that is back online. I've also done this with, uh, uh, like a, with a VRF, with a master and slave systems. Uh, we, there was another bank that had a, uh, a slave that was a similar size, and the master board was the one with the problem on a different bank, and I was able to swap those out because what was wrong with that master controller didn't matter for the other bank on that slave. And so by swapping those, there's still that other board still has a problem, but that unit's not going to see it. And it gives me a good board and I could immediately get the customer resolution where typically that's a board we have to then order and it may be a few weeks before we can get the parts in, get it installed and get them back online. The instructions for these boards is known as a logic sequence. And that is what the, whether it be the manufacturer or the field technician is putting together. It's a series of logic blocks that they're able to piece together a and, or, or an if type sequence. Now, those are just very basic forms of uh, how to create an, an essential, just a, a core fundamental, right? It gets far more complicated. So you get into things like PIDs or PIDs. You get into things like clocks or staging delays or timers. So the logic sequence does get very complex depending on what it is you're trying to control and just how deep that control goes. Ultimately, the bare bones of what logic is trying to do is it has a set point and its objective is to satisfy that set point and 
it's going to look at the inputs coming into the logic, whatever it's programmed for, and then it's going to manipulate the outputs so that it, in, it gets the inputs closer to the set point they've been given. This core function doesn't matter if it's an OEM or a PLC. We're using the same type of logic to accomplish that task and they're functioning in the identical way. Now logic sequences is something that I will be covering in more depth. I have a program called GFX, something that Distech offers that I, I can, I'm going to go in and we're going to do a more detailed review. I'm going to show you more logic sequences and I'm going to give you a better breakdown so you can get a visual uh, bird's eye view of what logic looks like in a graphical form. And I don't mean like the pretty graphics you see on a front end. I mean an actual like logic blocks and you, it'll make sense as we get into it. If you go look at the PDF with the guide, uh, you'll see some pictures of examples in there where I'm showing you some snippets of a logic block sequence. As technicians, I don't think our objective should be to fully learn how to necessarily write the logic, but we at minimum need to read it. When you begin to understand it, it does start to just look like a type of wiring diagram, but instead of physical wires, it's just, it's just logic. It's bits and information that's creating a, a series of events. Let's talk about serial communication. So essentially, serial communication that we use the most in HVAC comes in two basic forms. It's either RS-485 or RS-232. 232 tends to be a little bit of an older standard. Most modern equipment's gonna function on a 485. And then we use protocols. Now the protocol is just like a type of language, if you will. So let's talk about some troubleshooting of these boards. Most of the time, a PLC is going to have a 24 volt input power source. While a OEM board could be 120 volt or it could be 120 volt. And in some cases, like this board out of the VRF system, this one I think may even be a DC input power. But you should be aware that just because they have a set input power doesn't mean that the outputs aren't gonna have a higher value. So the digital output specifically can allow, say you've got a 24 volt input on a controller like this, well these output relays that's inside the board will allow 120 volts or 240 volts to pass through them. Now it's not recommended to pass the high voltage through these versus using isolation relays. They can do it and it's something to be aware of on your side. There is a noteworthy distinction between a triac and a electromechanical relay. So on this board, there are a set of electromechanical relays. This is a, say, an older design, if you will. A lot of the new boards coming out are not going to have electromechanical relays going forward. It's not that they won't be used at all, but the vast majority of the industry is switching to triacs because they're smaller and they're cheaper. A drawback to them is they don't have the same current capacity load that a actual mechanical relay would have. But the big pushback the manufacturer is going to have to that is, well, ultimately, they recommend you use isolation relays anyway, so you wouldn't be passing much load through them. So the Triax are just a solid state device that is able to pass voltage both ways through them. Ultimately, it has a set of gates, if you will, that is able to activate. And when those gates are activated, it allows the current to pass through. And when they're deactivated, it puts them in a state where it is not able to pass. Now, they are known for allowing ghost voltages, so if you're not very careful with how you're testing them, they can fool you into thinking that there is a voltage across there that there isn't. Now, to troubleshoot a digital output, it's gonna be very similar to troubleshooting any kind of relay. Uh, most of these terminal strips are gonna have a common bus, so like on this one, it is this terminal here, and then I have three output points. So I can measure across any of these in order to get my reading. Typically, a zero reading would indicate to you that the relay is closed and it's passing power through. So in this particular case, you can see where it says bus there. We would have to run a jumper, let's say from our 24 volts feed in down to this bus terminal and then we could feed a set of relays activating something downstream like a contactor. Keep in mind with all of these components, they are soldered to these boards. They're not meant to be serviceable. You're not gonna fix it. You're not gonna replace it the vast majority of the time. So in addition to digital outputs, there are also analog outputs. So digital outputs, just to clarify that, 
That's just an off or on state. That just means that it's either passing through or it's not. There's no in-between and there's no scaling of any kind. Now with analog outputs, and this is true for inputs as well, you have a scale of zero to a hundred percent. And so let's say you had a analog output that was uh, a zero to 10 volt output and it was outputting five volts DC. Well, that would make it a 50% output from that terminal. Now your analog points could widely range depending on what exactly it is you're trying to control. Most of the time we're doing things like actuators, but some other examples would be something like a VFD speed reference. To troubleshoot your analog points, you're really gonna have to just look at what your options are for that board and what you're trying to troubleshoot. Now this particular controller tells us that its analog output is designed to do a 0 to 10 volt DC at 5 milliamps max, which would be enough to engage a relay or send a reference signal to a VFD, but that would be about it. It also has a 10 volts DC output if you needed it for consistent power. This could be used to feed something like a set of transducers, which would then give a reference feedback into these input terminals. Now these are your analog inputs. So we would troubleshoot analog inputs very similar to how we would troubleshoot analog outputs, but the components would be different, whether that be temperature sensors, whether that be a VFD reference feedback, or if it could even be pressure transducers for refrigerant pressure or static pressure. What's critical here is you see all these grounds, whether you're testing the outputs or inputs, it's highly suggested that you're testing these terminal points back to their ground source for the most accurate readings. If you try to read ground on the actual chassis and this board doesn't have a really good ground, you're going to get some off readings. Or even if you tried to use ground somewhere else on this board, you run the risk of just not having a stable reading and it could affect your troubleshooting. So highly suggest you use these. In this particular case, this is our analog outputs and analog inputs terminal strips. So we have a ground, 10 volts DC out, ground, analog output, ground, analog input, ground, and analog input. So it would be just as simple as just testing across here like that to get a voltage reading and to see what we're doing. Now one fun fact, in addition to just analog outputs or inputs, sometimes you see a U for universal input or output on a control board. It is there to just serve as an either or. It can serve as a digital point and it can serve as an analog point. You can also convert a analog output to be functioning as a binary point or as a digital point meaning that instead of it having a scale you could just have that analog go straight from zero to 100 percent as its you know scaling option and that would effectively convert it into a but a digital output because we wouldn't be using the scale even though it's theoretically a analog output when it comes down to it i always start with verifying my power to my boards and my communication. Anytime I'm trying to figure out or I'm worried about there's a, there's a problem or a system I'm trying to troubleshoot, whether it be an OEM board or a PLC style board, you'd be surprised how many times I've walked up to a unit and I'm just not even getting power to it. Or I'm working with another technician on a tech support service and we've even gone as far as replacing boards before they realized the transformer was never outputting. And that was on an OEM board, so it was less obvious. But this particular system had multiple layers of transformers and several boards in it. And it ended up being one of those transformers that controlled one particular board in that cabinet had failed. And it sounds simple and it sounds silly. But when you're walking up, if the first thing you do is go straight to troubleshooting the I.O. points, it is very, very easy to completely miss that there's not even power to the board to begin with, especially when those boards do not have any kind of an LED indicator. So for example, my input power is here. That's fairly easy to test, but I also have a set of communication terminals right here. And just below those, there is two LEDs to indicate TX and RX that is transmit and receive. And in short, those lights should be flashing erratically 
and without any true pattern, I would say. Now you could also look at this with your meter and depending on the meter that you have will depend on how well you can register that. Some meters don't give a live feed to their display. Most of the flukes that I'm aware of don't do that. They give you a averaged reading on the display itself. But what that means is that when you go to test communication, what you're looking for is you're going to set your meter to DC volts and then you're going to see the output screen of the meter is going to just fluctuate very erratically. And that's, that's a good sign. That means that there is data passing back and forth and the COM bus is trying to communicate and function. If you put your meter on there and it doesn't do anything at all and it's just solid, unless it's a problem with your meter, it's very likely that the COM bus is not communicating properly, which may be a part of your issue. So if you've got outputs that aren't triggering or the, the control board is not doing what you want it to, it's got to have communication back to the main system because that system is going to tell it, for example, when it's supposed to be occupied, when, what it's supposed to be doing and when. So if you do have the LEDs to help you, if they're just on solid or if they're flashing or if they're just not even on at all, then there's a pretty good indication that you've got a communication problem. And if I was the one there, I'm going to start there. Let's troubleshoot that piece of it first, start at the fundamentals, that's just the bare basics. Then we can get into more in-depth problems later. And one major tip that I have for you is if you have it available, use the front end or the HMI. Now HMI is human interface for any kind of equipment. It's just the, the control panel you walk up to and you push buttons and it gives you readings. That's a human interface and that is a way, it's a window for you to see into the, the mind of the computer, if you will, that's running this system. Depending on what you're working on, hopefully you can see a lot of the inputs coming into it. You can also see a lot of the outputs it's trying to send out or how it's responding to the particular situation through that interface. The more advanced systems typically have a fairly decent human interface, but not always. What's great about it though is being able to look at that interface and then compare that to what the board is actually doing and outputting it is an amazing tool that can help you troubleshoot very quickly. I hope this guide was helpful in giving you some of the information you need. Hopefully when you're in a situation where you're trying to deal with something like this, it's gonna help push you across that line. I will be doing full guides on how to troubleshoot independent different field device components such as actuators or temperature sensors and transducers. So there's going to be all of that in the works. All of those guides are going to have their own companion videos. It's going to be me sitting here showing you some of the hands-on. I'm very thankful for the community that we have here and just creating better outcomes for all of us and everybody. That's what all this comes back to. Let's create some better outcomes. Let's get families on a better track and let's get better technicians out in the field. With that, MTT, take care of your family, take care of your spouse, go spend some time with them. I'll see you guys around.